what is the location of the Garden of Eden? There are various mysteries in the Bible. However, a popular question that many ask is, what is the location of the Garden of Eden? To answer this question, we'll need to do some forensics. First, let us go to the Bible. Eden was the name of a region of the earth when God first created the world. The Hebrew word translated Eden is taken to mean pleasure or delight. In this area, God planted a garden. In this place, God spent time with the first man and they had a direct relationship. The Garden of Eden is notable for several reasons. First and foremost, it was planned and planted by none other than God himself. Second, is that it was the first home of mankind. Thirdly, it was a place with a great deal of variety, with all kinds of trees. Number four, it was a beautiful place, as it had trees that were pleasing to the eye. Number five, there was also the fact that it was a fertile and fruitful place. The only thing the Bible tells us concerning the Garden of Eden's location is found in Genesis 2, 10 to 14. Amplified Bible. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four branching rivers. The first river is named Pishon. It flows around the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good, delium, a fragrant, valuable resin, and onyx stone are found there. The name of the second river is Gion. It flows around the entire land of Cush in Mesopotamia. The third river is named Hidakal, Tigris. It flowed east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. According to the Bible, the area has four rivers and an abundance of resources, including fine gold and gemstones. The Garden of Eden was a place where man could meet God. The Creator was walking in the garden in the cool of day. In Genesis 3.8, and Adam and Eve could be with him and converse with him. There is no exact knowledge of the identity of the Pishon and Gion rivers. However, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers are well known. The key area in the map of the Middle East is what geographers call the Fertile Crescent. The band of fertile land which stretches from the River Nile in Egypt in the west northeast through the land of Israel, and then south and southeast to the plains surrounding the river Tigris and Euphrates, in what used to be called Mesopotamia, which means the middle of the rivers, Meso, middle, and Potamia, rivers. If the Tigris and Euphrates mentioned are the same rivers by those names today, that would put the Garden of Eden somewhere in the Middle East. However, even a small local flood can change the course of a river, and the flood of Noah's day was more than a localized flood. We know modern rivers today, such as the Tigris or Euphrates, because Noah and his sons named some rivers in the post-flood world after familiar pre-flood rivers. The flood radically changed the landscape of the earth. As a result, the actual location of the Tigris and Euphrates is unclear. It may be, that the contemporary rivers called the Tigris and Euphrates are merely named after those connected with Eden, in a similar way that Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, is named after the town in Judea. For centuries, people have been trying to find the Garden of Eden without any success. Different spots have been claimed as the original location of Eden, but no one can be sure. What happened to the Garden of Eden? The Bible does not explicitly say. During the flood, there's a good chance that the garden was utterly destroyed. So if we cannot locate the former Garden of Eden, the great question we should ask ourselves is whether we can ever experience another Eden. A new Eden, you may say. As a result of our restored relationship with God through Jesus Christ, we have access to the eternal Garden of God. Luke 23, 
Amplified Bible. One of the criminals who had been hanged on a cross beside him kept hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us from death. But the other one rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? We are suffering justly because we are getting what we deserve for what we have done. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, please, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. We read in paradise. Paradise, paradisos, a Persian term referring to a garden, park. In the present passage, it presents the state of bliss which Jesus promised to the criminal directly after death, pate. This assurance was so valuable to Jesus that it cost him something. It hurt Jesus to even say these words. Since speech occurs during exhalation, these short, terse utterances must have been particularly difficult and painful. Edwards. The one who laid down his life for us had defeated the serpent and opened paradise. Revelation 2.7 Amplified Bible He who has an ear, let him hear and heed what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes the world through believing that Jesus is the Son of God, I will grant the privilege to eat the fruit from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. For these overcomers, Eden is a promise of restoration and eternal life. This was meant first in the eternal sense of making it to heaven, which was no small promise to a church threatened with the removal of Jesus' presence. It is also meant to see the effects of the curse rolled back in our lives through walking in Jesus' redeeming love. A river with the water of life clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, is described as being in the New Jerusalem. This river flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Then the angel showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb Christ, in the middle of its streets. On either side of the river was the tree of life bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer exist anything that is cursed, because sin and illness and death are gone, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bond servants will serve and worship him with great awe and joy and loving devotion. Revelations 22, 1-3 the Bible starts with a tree of life, which man was not authorized to devour, after the sin at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now we see the tree of life again. It's a little hard to visualize this divine landscaping. John may be depicting a large street, with a river flowing down the middle and a large tree or sequence of trees that grows with roots on either side of the river. The visual picture presented is that the river of life flows down through the middle of the city, and the tree is large enough to span the river, so that the river is in the midst of the street, and the tree is on both sides of the river. Seeing the tree of life again suggests a restoration of all things. Now at last, almost at the end of the great drama of the Bible, man may return and legitimately enjoy the blessing which he was banished for illegitimately desiring. The Garden of Eden was a place of testing. Genesis 2.9, Amplified Bible. And in that garden the Lord God caused to grow from the ground every tree that is desirable and pleasing to the sight, and good, suitable, pleasant for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of experiential knowledge recognition of the difference between good and evil. The biblical Garden of Eden was described as a place of total provision. God had seen every detail in designing a home for humanity, created in his own image. There was nothing that Adam and Eve needed, and they were free to eat from any tree in the garden except for one. 
Adam failed the test. Unfortunately, the serpent in the garden, used by Satan, tempted Eve with a false promise of blessing, and the woman ate of the forbidden fruit. She then gave some of the fruit to her husband, who ate it himself. Both of them disobeyed the word of God. As a result, the repercussions of their disobedience were highly detrimental to themselves and to all of their descendants. Their innocence, their home, and their fellowship with God were lost. The Garden of Eden is a place to which we long to return. God needed to expel Adam and Eve from the garden, and once they were gone, he posted formidable cherubim to guard against unauthorized re-entry. Genesis 3, 23-24 Therefore the Lord God sent Adam away from the Garden of Eden to till and cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So God drove man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he permanently stationed the cherubim and the sword with the flashing blade, which turned round and round in every direction to protect and guard the way, entrance, access to the tree of life. Adam and Eve learned by the hard way of experience to discern between good and evil. In mercy, God protected Adam and Eve from the horrible fate of having to live forever as sinners by preventing them from eating from the tree of life. He drove out the man and he placed cherubim in the east of the Garden of Eden. Cherubim are always associated with the presence and glory of God. Ezekiel 10.1 Then I looked, and behold, in the expanse firmament that was over the heads of the cherubim, there appeared something glorious and brilliant above them looking like a huge sapphire stone formed to resemble a throne. It's important to remember that when cherubims are portrayed on earth, such as in the tabernacle, they signify a place of meeting with God. Though Adam and Eve and their descendants were prevented from eating the fruit of the tree of life by God's mercy, they could still come there to meet God. This was their holy of holies. They suffered the loss of connection with God, the loss of their home, and the loss of their childhood innocence. We all have a deep-seated desire to one day make our way back to the Garden of Eden. Ecclesiastes 3.11 He has made everything beautiful and appropriate in its time. He has also planted eternity, a sense of divine purpose in the human heart, a mysterious longing which nothing under the sun can satisfy except God. Yet man cannot find out, comprehend, grasp what God has done his overall plan from the beginning to the end. Due to our sin, we lost the Garden of Eden, that place of pleasure and delight. God, in His mercy and grace, will restore it to us through Christ.